Amen. Have you heard the latest definition of optimism? The latest definition of an optimist is someone who believes that the preacher is almost finished when he says, finally, finally. Well, I want to invite you to turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4. The Apostle Paul begins this portion of Scripture with the word finally. But it's not necessarily used here as a word of conclusion, but it's used as a word of transition. In other words, Paul is transitioning now to some practical principles about everyday Christian life. We've been going through the book of First Thessalonians, and today let's look at verses 1 through 12. Hear the word of the Lord. Finally then, brethren, we urge and exhort in the Lord Jesus that you should abound more and more, just as you received from us how you ought to walk and to please God. For you know what commandments we gave to you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in passion of lust, like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one should take advantage of and defraud his brother in this matter, because the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also forewarned you and testified. For God did not call us to uncleanness, but in holiness. Therefore, he who rejects this does not reject man, but God, who has also given us his Holy Spirit. But concerning brotherly love, you have no need that I should write to you, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. And indeed you do so toward all the brethren who are in all Macedonia. But we urge you, brethren, that you increase more and more, that you also aspire to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business, and to work with your own hands as we commanded you, that you may walk properly toward those who are outside and that you may lack nothing. The Apostle Paul compares the Christian life in many of his writings to a walk, your daily walk. In other words, you begin the Christian life by taking a step of faith. You take that step of faith, trusting in Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior. And you travel on the way. You know, the early believers in the book of Acts, they were described as a people who were of the way, the way. And the way being the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul describes it as a walk of faith, the Christian life. Now in this passage that I've just read to you, he speaks to the believers of Thessalonica and he addresses a few areas that could possibly prevent them as believers in their walk with the Lord from pleasing God. Notice in verse number 1. Paul says, finally, brethren, we urge and exhort in the Lord Jesus that you should abound more and more just as you receive from us how you ought to walk and please God. In other words, Paul is saying, I want to talk to you about your daily walk, your daily life, and I want to give you some instructions. I want to address some areas so that you're able to walk through life, live in life, conduct yourself in such a way to please Almighty God. You know, it's been said that every single person is living to please somebody. You're either living to please yourself, 
You're either living to please other people or you're living to please Almighty God. You know, I found in life that you can't please everybody. If you try to please everybody, you'll be unhappy yourself. If you try to please everybody, there'll be somebody who is not happy. But there's one person that we should live to please. There is one person that we should live each and every day for their approval, and that's Almighty God. And I want to preach on that subject this morning, living your life to please God. Living your life to please God. As believers, we should make it our ultimate aim to please God. But in this passage of Scripture, we find that there's a few areas, if we're not careful, they can prevent us from doing so. Now, you're probably asking, preacher, what are those areas that could potentially prevent, that could potentially hinder us from living a life that pleases God? The first area that Paul addresses in our text is our sexuality. Our sexuality. Look at verse number 3 of our text. Paul says, For this is the will of God. Now, sometimes people want to say, what is God's will? What is God's will about this matter? What is God's will about this decision that I'm up against in my life? There are some matters that you'll have to pray and seek God about and continue to read His Word and ask Him to give you wisdom about that matter of whether or not it's His will or not. But there are some things that God has clearly spelled out in His Word about His will. And here He says, It is the will of God, your sanctification. Now the word sanctification there means to be set apart from something and separated unto something. In other words, in the Old Testament, they would speak about the holy of holies. That was a special area in the tabernacle that was set apart and set aside solely for Almighty God. They would talk about the, the holy priest and the holy showbread and the holy instruments that was used in the temple in acts of worshiping to God. In other words, these things were set apart from the world's use. They were set apart from everyday use unto the service of the Lord. You see, you and I who have been saved by grace, who've trusted Christ as our Savior, we've been set apart, separated from the world, and set aside unto Jesus to be used for the Master's use. And as such, Paul here is saying, since you've been separated unto God, it's God's will that you abstain from sexual immorality. Do you see that in the text? Now the word abstain there means to, uh, to separate yourself, to say no to, to reject sexual immorality. And the phrase sexual immorality would speak of any type of sex outside of God's boundaries of holy matrimony between one man and one woman for a lifetime. God is saying as believers, if you want to live a life pleasing to God, you need to abstain from sexual immorality. Let me explain that and be very clear. That would speak of premarital sex. That would speak of extramarital sex. That would speak of homosexuality, uh, th those types of practices. That would speak of uh, polygamy. That would speak of pedophilia. That would speak of bestiality. That would speak of any type of sexual re relations outside of God's ordained boundaries for sexuality. Paul says, I want you to abstain from sexual immorality. Then he goes on to say in verse number 4 that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor. 
Now he's saying here, not only should you abstain, say no to any sexual practices outside of God's boundaries for sex, but you should also control yourself, exercise control. The word possess there means to master your desires. And the word vessel there speaks of your body. Let me read some other scriptures pertaining to this. Hold your place in 1 Thessalonians and turn with me to Romans chapter number 6. Romans chapter number 6. And let's look together at verses 19 through 22. Romans chapter 6 verses 19 through 22. The Bible here says Paul is speaking. uh, Chapter 6 verse 19. I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members, that means your body, as slaves of uncleanliness and of lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now, uh, that means since you're a believer, now present your members, that is your bodies, as slaves of righteousness for holiness. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. What fruit did you have then in the things which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now, having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness and the end everlasting life. In other words, Paul is saying God has saved you. He's placed you in his family. And now instead of giving your body, yourself to to sinful practices, to sexual immorality, yield your body to God to be used in his service and for his honor and for his glory. This same idea of self-control, exercising self-control is also referred to in 1 Timothy chapter number 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4 verse 7. Uh, Paul makes this statement to Timothy. He says, Timothy, if you want to be a good servant of the Lord Jesus Christ, the latter part of verse 7 says, exercise yourself toward godliness. Discipline yourself toward a godly lifestyle. So it's God's will for you and I to live a sanctified life even in the area of sexuality. Then we see in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 how that believers... In this area of sexuality are to live different from the godless society around them. Look at verse number 5 of our text. Paul says, Not in passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one should take advantage of and defraud his brother in this matter, because the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also forewarned you and testified. Paul here is saying, those who do not know God, those who are the Gentiles, those who are lost, the term Gentiles there is speaking generically, of people who do not know God. They live according to their feelings. You ever hear the terminology, if it feels good, then do it. Well, that's humanistic reasoning. That's the world's philosophy. That's the worldly system's ideology. But see, we live by a higher principle. We live not according to the dictates of our flesh, but according to the will of Almighty God. Not following our personal feelings, but following God's Word. And then Paul describes these people act this way not only because they follow their their personal feelings, the passion of lust, but they, they don't know God. You see, when a person knows God, they know God through a personal relationship through Jesus Christ. And when a person receives Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, the Holy Spirit moves into their heart. The Holy Spirit then tells the believer what is right and what is wrong. The Holy Spirit convicts the believer when he's doing what he's supposed to, and he convicts the believer showing him when he's doing something wrong. He guides the believer, letting him know if he's on the right path or on the wrong path. 
Paul is saying these that are on the outside, these who live according to their passions in this world, they do so because they don't know God. You see, knowing God brings you into a whole new dimension of life. You see, when you know Him, you want to please Him. When you know Him, you'll be guided by Him. When you know Him, you'll want to honor Him. When you know Him, you'll be led according to His Word. And then Paul goes on to say something else I, that I just read to you in verse number 6. How that those on the outside, those in our godless society, they take advantage of each other sexually. Now you say, how is it that they take advantage of each other sexually? They're always looking for a way to fulfill their desires. They're looking for another opportunity. They're looking for another hookup. But the sad thing of it is they are pushing each other towards the judgment of God. Now, the godless society may be thinking they're fulfilling their own passions, their own desires, but Paul says that they're pushing each other towards Towards the Lord who is the avenger of all such. In other words, they're headed for the judgment of God. Hebrews chapter number 13. Hold your place there in 1 Thessalonians and look at this verse. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse number 4 in your Bibles. The text says this. Marriage is honorable among all and the bed undefiled. But fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. Do you see that? Now you say, now preacher, I understand that in regards to lost people that yes, they're headed to the judgment of God. They're going to answer for their sins. They haven't received Christ as their Savior and so they're going themselves to stand in place for their own sins and bear the wrath of God. But what about those who have been saved? What about those who have trusted Christ as their Savior? Certainly as believers... Our sins were judged at Calvary. Our sins was judged at the cross when Jesus paid for our sins. But even though our sins were judged at the cross, we'll not answer at the judgment of God for our sins because they were judged at Calvary. But the law of sowing and reaping still applies even to believers. You remember David in the Old Testament. He was a believer. David was a man who had a heart for God, yet he committed adultery. And this sin that he brought in his life was forgiven, but the consequences still played out. If you sow to the flesh, you'll reap corruption. If you sow to sin, you'll reap the consequences as such. Yes, you can be forgiven, but God doesn't always remove the the consequences in this life. And then I go another step further. We're to live a life of holiness. And one way is by being sexually pure. Look at verse 7. For God did not call us to uncleanness, but in holiness. Now Paul has just mentioned the fact that one motivating factor for living a sexually pure life is the judgment of God. But also another motivating factor is looking back to that moment when He called you into a relationship with Himself. Look back to that time when He called you to trust Christ as your Savior and realize that He had a purpose, He had a plan, and you're no longer your own. You belong to Him. You're to live for Him. You're to honor Him. And as such, He wants you to live a holy and a pure life. And then Paul here tells us in verse number 8, if we reject this message, if we reject God's standard on sexuality, then we're not necessarily rejecting man's word. We're rejecting the word of God. Verse 8 says, Therefore he who rejects this does not reject man, but God who has also given us his Holy Spirit. Paul saying to these believers at Thessalonica, Don't get mad at me. I'm just the messenger. Don't get it mad at the mailman because he brings the bills to your house. He's just a delivery person. 
Paul is saying this is a message from God. The world says whatever feels good, do it. God's Word says exercise self-control as believers. Now, you're probably thinking, well, preacher, do you believe that, that sexuality is wrong, that sex is a sin? Absolutely not. As a matter of fact, God has given to one man and one woman that gift of sex in holy matrimony to be used for procreation and also pleasure between two people united in Christ. But you see, I heard the old illustration one time that sex in a home is like a fire. Now, in a fireplace, a fire can make you feel good. A fire can warm the house up. A fire can make everything feel nice. A fire can make the house warm and enjoyable. But if you take that fire out of the fireplace and you start a fire in the middle of the living room floor, you'll burn the whole house down. And see, that's the same case in the matter of sexuality. If it's used within God's boundaries of marriage, then it can warm a home, it can warm a marriage, it can bring pleasure, it can bring satisfaction when it's used within God's intended boundaries. Well, God here says that we are to live a life of pleasing Him in the area of Sexuality. Then number two in our text, he addresses another area in which we're to live in such a way to please him, and that is our love for other believers. Look with me at verse number nine of our text. Paul says, But concerning brotherly love, you have no need that I should write to you, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. Do you see that? And indeed you do so toward all the brethren who are in Macedonia. But we urge you, brethren, that you increase more and more. Paul's saying to these believers at Thessalonica, you need to love each other. You are loving each other. You're loving each other already because God has taught you to love. Now how does God teach us to love? How has God taught us to love? Well, he's taught us to love by giving his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. A while ago, I was just reading that scripture in Romans chapter 5, verse number 8, that says, God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. It's the giving of his son, giving up of his son to die on a cross in our place was one way God has taught us to love. Then God the Son has taught us to love by that new commandment that he gave to us. You remember in John chapter number 13, Jesus said, I've got a new commandment for you. And this commandment is to love one another. And he said, and when you love each other, they'll know that you're my disciples by your love for one another. And then the Holy Spirit has taught us to love. In Romans chapter 5, verse number 5, the Bible describes how that the Holy Spirit of God, when He convicted us and He regenerated us, when we exercised faith in Christ, He poured the love of God into our hearts. The God's love was shed abroad in our hearts and lives through the Holy Spirit. And then Paul goes on to explain how this love should be present in your midst toward all believers. Did you catch that? You yourselves are taught by God to love one another, and indeed you do so toward all the brethren. The word brethren there speaks of all brothers and sisters in Christ. And he goes on to say, and all who are in Macedonia... In other words, these believers at Thessalonica, they loved each other, the ones that they knew, and they also loved the brothers and sisters in Christ that they were going to get to know. They were a hospitable people. They were a loving people. They had an open door and an open heart and an open uh, mind towards other people. They loved each other. And then Paul goes on to tell them, he said, yes, 
you do have love. Yes, you are loving, and I commend you for that. But I want it to increase, and the word increase there means to abound more and more. Now, in the Greek language, there's, uh, there are four basic words for love. There's the word eros, which speaks of physical love. There is the word storge, which speaks of family love, the love that parents have for their children. Then there is the word philea, which speaks of a deep affection, a friendship love for each other. And then there's the highest love of all. And that's agape love. You see, that is the John 3, 16 love, where God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. That's the, the 1 Corinthians 13 love that doesn't puff itself up and that overlooks our faults. And that's patient and long-suffering. It's unconditional. It's a selfless Love. It's a love not based on feelings. It's a willful, unconditional kind of love that's only experienced through a relationship with God. Paul is saying, I want your love to increase more and more. I want it to be consistent. I want it to be persistent. But I also want your love to rise to the level of God's love for you. The same love that God has for you unconditionally at all times, not based upon circumstances or feelings. I want you to have for one another. Boy, wouldn't that be great to have that kind of love and to share that kind of love? I mean, to love each other, to love all believers in the family of God. As believers, we should love. Have you ever noticed how that animals do certain things without being taught? A bird, it flies in the air, but it doesn't go to bird school to learn how to fly. A uh, fish, they do swim in schools, but they don't actually go to school and take lessons on learning how to swim. Why does a bird fly? Why does a fish swim? Why does a cow naturally, a mother cow, know how to take care of a calf? You see, it's in their nature to do such. You see, the Bible tells us how in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4, how that you and I, when we were saved, we were given the nature of God within us. And the Bible says in 1 John how that God is love, and since He is love, His nature is to love. And since we've been given the nature of God, then we should have that same kind of love, and it should just naturally overflow out of us towards one another. I want to ask you, are you loving each other? Are you asking God to help you increase in your love for other people? I know some people are like sandpaper, aren't they? I mean, you like them at a distance, but just no matter how, when you get up close to them, they'll just rub you the wrong way. But you see, even those who rub us the wrong way, even those who maybe get on our nerves, God's love, that agape love can supersede all of that when we allow God's love to flow in us and through us to each other. And then lastly, Paul addresses one more area. He's talking about living a life to please God, conducting yourself in a way that would please God. He's speaking very practically. He talks about our sexuality. He talks about our uh, love for one another. And then finally, he talks about our conduct before the society around us. Look at verse number 11. Paul here says that you may also aspire to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business, and to work with your own hands as we commanded you, that you may walk properly toward those who are outside, that you may lack nothing. 
In other words, Paul is saying right here, the world is watching. And since the world is watching, you and I, we should live a quiet life. That means living in such a way in our communities peacefully without causing a public disturbance or commotion. You know, have you ever heard the terminology, they raise a lot of cain, figuratively speaking. You ever heard that term, that idea? Well, see, we as believers, we should live in such a way not to be raising cain and causing a disruption, but living in such a way that Christ would be magnified and not us. Then Paul goes on here to say that we're to live in such a way where we mind our own business. You ever heard of a busybody? They're going here and they're going there trying to find out things. I was serving at another church one time in another state. And we lived in a parsonage across the road from the church. And I was so thankful y'all don't have a parsonage. You know there needs to be some separation between everybody at times. But anyway, we lived in the parsonage. It was a nice home. And there was a lady in that church, and she was retired. And bless her heart, from sunup to sundown, she run up and down the roads in that community, seeing what everybody was doing all the time. One day in the evening, Misty was in the kitchen, and she's looking out the front window. And she said, can you believe, and I'll not say her name, can you believe so-and-so, I've counted, she's been by our house at least 17 times today. And when she'd come by, you know how somebody does, does when they want to be nosy. They'll drive real slow when they get to your house. <laughs> See, that's what you call a busybody. I've heard it said before, if you worry about keeping your own back porch cleaned off, you won't have to worry about everybody else. And then Paul goes on here to say in our text how that we're to work with our own hands. Now, the Roman people of that day, they resented manual labor. But Paul says it's good. You see, God put Adam in, and, and Eve in the garden before the fall ever happened and commanded them to tend to work that garden. You see, it's good to work. It's good to make a living. It's good to provide for yourself as God gives you strength and ability to do so. Some of those believers at Thessalonica uh, had avoided working their jobs. They said, well, since Jesus is coming, I'll quit my job. I'll not pay for my house. I'll just live. And what happened was they were having to depend on other people to keep them up. Paul said, no, don't do that. The world is watching you. You don't want them to look at you as lazy Christians. You don't want them to look at you as deadbeat Christians. You want them to look at you as Christians who have peace in your heart, Christians who are minded in your own business, your own relationship with God and Christians who are willing to work with your own hands to provide for yourselves. And he says in verse 12 that you may lack in nothing. Walking properly to those who are on the outside. You see, people are watching you and I. And Paul said, if you want to live a life pleasing unto God, you need to be careful that you don't do anything that would detract from the gospel of Jesus Christ by your life. I want to ask you this morning, are you living a life to please God? Are you living a life to honor Him? Are you making that your aim? You see, if you live each and every day trying to please people, you'll always come up short because somebody won't be happy. But if you do succeed in pleasing a lot of other people, you'll be miserable yourself. So the aim of the child of God is to live each and every day that he might be honored, that he might be glorified, that he might be pleased with your life, your attitude, your actions, your day-to-day -day conduct. Do you desire to please God? Is that your desire? To please him and only him. Let's stand to our feet. If God spoke to your heart this morning as Miss Cindy plays, I want to invite you to come. If God spoke to you about some sin, you need to come and confess. Would you come? If He's touching your heart today, would you mind Him right there where you are with every head bowed and every eye closed, with nobody looking, 
Is there some confession, some sin you need to repent of there in your heart? Please do. Ask God to forgive you, to cleanse you. He will. He promises. Do you desire to please Him? Dear Christian, then tell Him right there where you are, Lord, I want to please you. I want to conduct myself in such a way to please and honor you each and every day in the practical day-to-day things of life. If that's your desire, you tell Him. If you need to come and be saved this morning, you come. We're going to sing one verse. Have thine own way, Lord.